We know next to nothing about the life of Ignatius of Antioch. The little we know comes from Eusebius' ecclesiastical history written in the 4th century. And Eusebius writes, Ignatius, who was chosen as Bishop of Antioch, second in succession to Peter, and whose fame is still celebrated by a great many, report says that he was sent from Syria to Rome and became food for wild beasts on account of his testimony to Christ. And he has made the journey through Asia under the strictest military surveillance. He fortified the parishes in the various cities where he stopped by oral homilies and exhortations and warned them above all to be especially on their guard against the heresies that were beginning to prevail and exhorted them to hold fast to the tradition of the apostles. Moreover, he taught, he thought, excuse me, it was necessary to attest that tradition in writing and to give it a fixed form for the sake of greater security. Other than this introductory material that states that Ignatius was a contemporary of Polycarp in Smyrna and Papias in Hierapolis, uh, and second in succession to Peter, Eusebius' account uh, is limited simply to Ignatius' final days. Michael Holmes uh, includes a poetic description of our knowledge of Ignatius, and it's worth repeating. He writes, just as we become aware of a mediator, uh, excuse me, a medi, a medi, meteor, well, it's a good thing I don't talk for a living, <laughs> Just as we become aware of a meteor only when, after traveling silently through space for untold millions of miles, it, bra it blazes briefly through the atmosphere before dying in a shower of fire, so it is with Ignatius, Bishop of Antioch. We meet him for the first and only time for just a few weeks, not long before his death, as a martyr in Rome in the second century. What we know of Ignatius, other than, of course, uh, the later accounts of his martyrdom and then through Eusebius, comes through his seven epistles written during his trek to Rome to be fed to wild beasts. Six of these epistles are written to churches in southwestern Asia Minor. The seventh, then, is a personal letter to the younger bishop of Smyrna at the time, Polycarp. And, and these epistles are invaluable to the church because they, they open a small window uh, into the life of the church of the uh, late 1st, early 2nd century. Uh, in Syria, as, since that's where he's coming from, but then also in Asia Minor, these churches through which he is traveling and to which he is writing. The epistles are brief in length, but deep in theology. Ignatius clearly confesses the two natures in Christ against the Docetists and the Ebionites. He warns of the threat of Judaizers and draws clear lines of demarcation between Judaism and Christianity. And although soteriology is not part or is not the purpose of the epistles, uh, Ignatius' witness to the universal atonement made by Christ through his blood and the doctrine of justification uh, by faith alone. And Michael Holmes, again, distills Ignatius' utmost concerns to three items. Uh, the church's struggle against false teachers within the church, unity and structure of the churches, and the bishop's coming martyrdom. The second of Holmes' themes, the unity and structure of the churches, uh, this is the chief presentation or the chief concern of this presentation today. I hope to demonstrate that Ignatius' witness to the threefold office of the ministry uh, is not only a reference to how the church was structured, but also then the reason that the church structured itself this way, uh, specifically the purpose of it being the unity of the churches. Before delving into Ignatius' epistles, though, two brief studies are beneficial. First, it's helpful to explore uh, the little we know about Ignatius' life, namely his journey from Rome, or to Rome, for martyrdom, and how it fits into the church's confession of the faith, uh, and, and sometimes, and often, most times, hostile Roman Empire. And then second, before exploring what Ignatius writes about the threefold office of the ministry, it's wise to explore uh, what the New Testament and other, uh, two other documents from the Apostolic Fathers, uh, what they have to say. Uh, so documents that are roughly contemporaneous with Ignatius' epistles. And so this will give us a bit of historical and theological framework within which we can understand Ignatius. So Ignatius in context, why was he sent to Rome? The vast majority of scholars date Ignatius' death 
to the reign, uh, during the reign of the Emperor Trajan, uh, who reigned from 98 to 117 AD. And we get this from Eusebius. He tells us that Ignatius was sent from Syria to Rome and became food for wild beasts on account of test his testimony of Christ. Uh, and in his Chronicon, uh, we did not include this in the paper, but in Eusebius' uh, Chronicle, uh, he specifically mentions uh, that it was in the final year of Trajan's reign in which, uh, in which Ignatius was martyred. Now, this raises an interesting conundrum, one that we've been talking about in seminary class, actually. Trajan is the first emperor to have ruled specifically on the treatment of Christians. And in his famous rescript to Pliny the Younger, who was proconsul of Bithynia, Pliny had written to Trajan inquiring what was to be done about accusations against Christians. Christians, just by virtue of being Christians, violated Roman law because Christianity was at that time considered an illicit religion. And so Roman law uh, forbade this uh, because then this illicit religion of theirs uh, also then forbade Christians from participating in the state, of, or the state cult. Pliny accuses Christians of holding on to uh, superstition, which was a technical, legal charge. Uh, Rome viewed all non-state sanctioned religions as superstition, and the crime was a capital offense in the empire. Trajan's rescript is brief, and it's worth citing in full. Trajan to Pliny, greeting. In investigating the cases of those who had been accused as Christians to you, my Secundus, you have pursued the procedure which you ought to have pursued. For there cannot be established a general rule, as a general rule, any method which can have as a fixed standard. Search for them must not be made, uh, but if they should be accused and should be charged, they must be punished. In such a way, however, that he who shall have denied that he is a Christian and shall have made this clear in reality, that is by praying to our gods, may gain pardon as a result of his penitence, although suspected in the past. Moreover, indictments presented without an author ought not to have a place in any accusation, uh, for, it is both, it is, for it both is a very bad precedent and not in accord with our time. So Trajan's policy towards the towards the Christians is simple. Search for them is not to be made. And this is a point that the second century apologists would bring out in full. If it's a crime, why aren't you making a search for it? So search for Christians is not to be made. However, if someone is accused of being a Christian, then he's to be punished, and in that punishment, given the opportunity to deny his participation in this illicit religion. If he denies, then he demonstrates that denial by praying to the Roman gods, and then afterwards he would receive pardon. The accused, however, who persisted in their confession of Christ, and being a Christian, in spite of the punishments, was then to be executed. Finally, in Roman law, uh, in accord with Roman law, rather, anonymous accusations then held no merit. The contradiction then between Trajan's rescript, Eusebius' statements, and Ignatius' own words about fighting wild beasts in Rome becomes clear then. Uh, why was it that Ignatius was carted all the way from Antioch in Syria to Rome rather than simply just being executed in Antioch of Syria? So two options have been posited by scholars as to answer this question. Uh, so it's known that Trajan hosted he sponsored games in the Colosseum at Rome to celebrate the end of his Dacian expedition around the year 107 AD. Uh, and the games were quite gruesome. Uh, one scholar notes that in Trajan's games, 10,000 gladiators perished, and after all the prisoners had been thrown to them, 11,000 wild beasts were slaughtered. People complain about the NFL being violent. <laughs> The provinces, they supplied the prisoners. And so perhaps Ignatius had been accused and tried uh, as being a Christian, and rather than immediate execution there on the spot, then he was reserved for Trajan's games. Uh, now, this would predate Trajan's rescript to Pliny by six years. That's the first theory. The second theory, then, is put forward by T.G. Wilkins, uh, who is of the opinion that Ignatius martyrdom most likely occurred later than 107, around 115 to 116 AD. And Wilkin holds that 
On the basis of Trajan's presence in Antioch during a violent earthquake towards the end of AD 115, that could well have provided an occasion for a public outcry against Christians to force Trajan's otherwise seemingly reluctant hand against them. It wasn't uncommon for pagans to call for the punishment and the death and the persecution of Christians once a natural disaster happened. In fact, later in the second century, Tertullian of Carthage witnesses to this fact that even in his time in, Western, in the far western reaches of the empire, uh, these outcries still regularly occurred. He wrote in his apology, if the Tiber rises as high as the city walls, if the Nile does not send its waters up over the fields, if the heavens give no rain, if there is an earthquake, uh, if there is a famine or pestilence, straightway the cry is, away the Christians to the lion. And then in typical Tertullian fashion, uh, he mocks them to say, how do you expect to kill all of those Christians with one lion? <laughs> now the earlier date for Eusebius' martyrdom, this aligns with Eusebius' record in his chronicle where he states that Ignatius was martyred in the 10th year of Trajan's reign, uh, which would have been AD 107-108. To this author, the earlier date makes more sense when considered against Trajan's rescript as well. Uh, this traditional interpretation of the events, then, which led to Ignatius' martyrdom, they were called into question by P. and Harrison in 1936. Harrison suggested that rather than persecution in the Antiochian church, the reason for Ignatius' martyrdom, uh, his departure rather, excuse me, was schism with the bishop on the minority side. Harrison's interpretation, it's been widely adopted since its publication in 1936, uh, and recent scholars have, ex uh, have expounded, I should say, uh, on Harrison's hypothesis. Some point out that there's no historical evidence uh, of a state-sponsored persecution in Antioch during Trajan's reign as well as the fact that Ignatius never mentions such an event in any of his epistles. So we don't have any external evidence or internal evidence of such a, uh, such a persecution in Syria at that time. The basic argument is that Ignatius himself was at the center of the discord and recognizing this fact, sacrificed himself to the local authorities to secure concord in the church. This argument, uh, since the time of P. and Harrison, uh, it rests chiefly upon linguistic but also thematic similarities between Ignatius' epistle to the Romans, uh, in which he discusses his coming martyrdom, and then two chapters, well, really specifically uh, just one chapter in First Clement, First Clement chapter 54. Chapter 56 alludes to it, but, but chapter 54 is the main, uh, bears the most striking similarity to his words in his epistle to the Romans. In those chapters, Clement counseled the Corinthians responsible for the discord at the Corinthian congregation to leave the congregation and go elsewhere for the sake of restoring concord and harmony in the church. This creative theory helps to explain Ignatius' preoccupation with concord, uh, as well as his comments uh, in Philadelphians 10.1, Smyrnians 11.2, and Polycarp 7.1, uh, that while in Troas, he received word from the Antiochian church that it had regained peace. In the first four of his epistles, we should note here, I should explain this a bit more. In the first four of his seven epistles, uh, he asks all of the churches to pray for the church in Syria because it's because of it's uh, this. Um, he doesn't specifically say persecution, but because of the strife and the turmoil and the discord that it's uh, being subjected to. But then, uh, and he writes the first four of his epistles from Smyrna. The next leg of his journey, though, they stop in Troas, where they will then take a uh, ship over to Neapolis, and then from there to Philippi, and then from there to Rome. Uh, but it's there while he's in Troas that he receives news from Antioch that whatever it was that was happening in Antioch, persecution, schism, whatever, or, or a combination of the two, it's been brought to a peaceful resolution. So to those, uh, it's to the Philadelphians, the Smyrnians, and then to Polycarp, Bishop of Smyrna, each of those epistles then... Instead of saying, pray for the church at Antioch, it's, y'all should send a delegation to the church at Antioch to congratulate them, both on your own behalf and on mine. So that's what we're, what we're talking about with these three passages here from his epistles. While in Troas received word that the Antiochian church had regained peace. In the traditional interpretation, the peace achieved in Antioch is the cessation of persecution. In what I will call the revisionist interpretation, uh, the peace is interpreted as an end to the schism. 
This theory also accounts for Ignatius' self-depreciation that runs through his epistle by claiming that Ignatius knew that he was the cause for the discord and the strife in his own church. And so while this interpretation of Ignatius' context provides fresh answers for old questions, it actually ends up raising more questions than it answers. It also casts Ignatius in a negative light as one who would abdicate his office, uh, which would then diminish his martyrdom to the level of self-sacrifice simply for the sake of appeasing the group or appeasing the, the majority or minority. So in the end, the revisionist theory is creative. It's a creative answer to an unsolvable problem at this point. The Office of the Ministry in the Apostolic Fathers. As an assessment of the Office of the Ministry in the entire corpus of the Apostolic Fathers is beyond the scope of this paper. However, two documents that are roughly contemporary with Ignatius' epistle, the Didache and First Clement, help us understand the nature of the threefold office of the ministry in Ignatius' time. We'll look first at the Didache. The Didache is a brief church order that dates to the late 1st to mid 2nd century AD. It consists of 16 chapters. The first, cha the first six chapters serve as a catechism out outlining the two ways of life. The church order itself begins in chapter 7 and includes instruction for baptism, fasting, prayer, and Eucharistic prayers. The final chapters of the church order deal with the office of the ministry and demonstrates the fluidity of the ministry at the time in which the Didache was written. Chapter 11 deals exclusively with this fluidity. It reads, So if anyone should come and teach you all these things that have been just mentioned above, welcome him. But if the teacher himself goes astray and teaches a different teaching that undermines all this, do not listen to him. However, if his teaching contributes to righteousness and knowledge of the Lord, welcome him as you would the Lord. Now concerning the apostles and prophets, deal with them as follows in accordance with the rule, dogma, of the gospel. Let every apostle who comes to you be welcomed as if he were the Lord, but he is not to stay for more than one day, unless there is need, in which case he may stay another. But if he stays three days, he is a false prophet. And when the apostle leaves, he is to take nothing except bread until he finds his next night's lodging. But if he asks for money... He is a false prophet. Also, do not test or evaluate any prophet who speaks in the Spirit, for every sin will be forgiven, but this will not be forgiven. However, not everyone who speaks in the Spirit is a prophet, but only if he exhibits the Lord's ways. By his conduct, therefore, will the false prophet and the prophet be recognized. Furthermore, any prophet who orders a meal in the Spirit shall not partake of it. If he does, he is a false prophet. If any prophet preaches the truth, yet does not practice what he preaches, he is a false prophet. But any prophet proven to be genuine, who does something with a view to portraying in a worldly manner the symbolic meaning of the church, provided that he does not teach you uh, to do all that he himself does, is not to be judged by you, for his judgment is with God. Besides, the ancient prophets also acted in a similar manner. But if anyone should say in the spirit, give me money, or anything else, do not listen to him. But if he tells you to give on behalf of others who are in need, let no one judge him. So the problem that the didachist is dealing with at the end of the didache then is itinerant preachers. Uh, prophets appear as a grade with as a grade in the office of the ministry already in the New Testament. We see this in such places as 1 Corinthians 12, 28 and following. 1 Corinthians 14.1, Acts 13.1, uh, and Ephesians 4.11. And then, by way of example, Agabus in Acts 11.28 and Acts 21.10. The apostles then mentioned in the Didache, they were missionaries who carried out the work of evangelization after the death of the original apostles. Most likely well-established Christian churches sent them out to spread the gospel to towns and villages where it had not yet been preached. And so, this resembles St. Luke and St. Paul's use of the word apostle when St. Luke uses the word apostle to describe Barnabas in Acts 14.14 14, and Epaphroditus in Philippians 2.25. Uh, we, we need to note, though, however, uh, most translations obscure that reference by translating uh, apostolum as messenger rather than apostle. So you have apostle in the narrow sense of the twelve, but you have apostle in a broader sense of 
anyone who is sent by an apostolic church or working in concert with these apostolic men. But as the Lord promised in Matthew 7, 25, and St. Paul attested to in 2 Corinthians eleven thirteen, false prophets and false apostles, prophets, uh, were an ever-present reality for all the churches. The Didachist establishes rubrics for how churches should judge whether an itinerant apostle or prophet is true or false. The first test is doctrine. The churches were to receive the itinerant preachers as the Lord as long as their teaching aligned with the things which have been said before specifically with the teaching of the two ways, the catechetical material uh, in the first six chapters. No new teaching was to be admitted in the church. The second test is conduct. Two true prophets and apostles will stay in a place for only one day, two if necessity demands. The prophet who stays for three days, however, is false. If the itinerant preacher asks for anything more than bread for his journey, he's false. And if while in the spirit... He commands a table to be set for the congregation, and he himself eats from it, then he is also false. And finally, if while in the spirit he says, give me money, or anything else to that effect, then he is false. So, thankfully, we don't have to deal with this sort of thing in the church today. <laughs> These tests, then, will protect the churches uh, from roaming charlatans who only sought to take advantage of the church. And the fact that this was written down and preserved, as well as it was in the early church, shows us just how big of a problem itinerant apostles and prophets were in this area. Chapter 12 of the Didache then presents similar counsel for traveling Christians. So, so not men in the office, but simply traveling Christians, laymen. They are to be examined. If they are passing through, the church may help them. But the traveling Christian is not to stay except for two or three days if some necessity arises. However, if the Christian wants to settle in the area and knows a trade then he may do so. If he does not know a trade, the church was to determine how he would make a living for himself. Uh, but if he does not wish to cooperate, he is a Christ peddler. Chapter 13, then, combines the counsel of the previous two chapters to state that the true prophets, that the true prophets can settle in the area, and that those who do so uh, is like the worker worthy of his food. The itinerant preacher who willfully settles in an area is to be given the first fruits of the wine press and the threshing floor of oxen and sheep, for they are your high priests. The Didacus calls them in 13.3. Uh, they are also to be supplied with money, clothing, and every possession in accordance with the commandment. Kraft notes uh, that the giver has some freedom within this general obligation to determine his exact contribution. So itinerant prophets and apostles could become uh, permanent, and this would be then the procedure for how they are to do so. Being served by itinerant preachers, though, as we are well aware, is not ideal for the church and easily opens up the church to uh, the possibility of being preyed upon by uh, charlatans and conmen. The Didoch's ultimate answer to the problem of itinerant preachers comes in chapter 15, verse 1. He writes, Therefore appoint for yourselves bishops and deacons worthy of the Lord, men who are humble and not avaricious, and true and approved, for they too carry out for you the ministry in the Greek, of the prophets and the teachers. You must not therefore despise them, for they are your honored men along with the prophets and teachers. The churches are encouraged to establish a permanent ministry in their midst, appointing for themselves bishops and deacons who render the same service as the prophets and the teachers. And by including the prophets and the teachers with the bishops and deacons as honored ones, the Didachist seeks to gently guide the churches into this transition, not castigating them for their previous practice, but moving them to, a permanent, uh, to permanent indigenous bishops and deacons who would provide a regular ministry of the word and sacrament, uh, but also then guard the church's doctrine through the office of oversight, through the office of the bishop. Now, what does all this have to do with Ignatius of Antioch? Well, scholars believe that Syria is the province of the Didache, uh, although not necessarily Antioch in Syria, which is, I believe, if memory serves, the third largest city in the empire at this time, but rather that its province was the backwaters of Syria, so out in the country, and not the metropolitan area. Francis Sullivan believes that the Didache was written for newly established Christian communities, uh, which would explain its model both for worship, catechesis, and the ministry. 
Robert Grant notes that the situation of itinerant apostles and prophets is not found in other churches, such as the church at Rome, as is demonstrated by First Clement. So if the, if the situation of itinerant preachers is isolated to the backwaters of Syria in the late 1st century to mid-2nd century, the Didache witnesses uh, to the attempted regularization of the office of the ministry. While prophets could settle in the area, the Didachist clearly exhorts the churches to adopt the Episcopal polity that would have already been in use at Antioch. Uh, the fluidity that had characterized the office of the ministry was coming to an end in favor of a permanent ministry of oversight. First Clement. The fluidity of the ministry that we see in the Didache seems limited to its provenance. Uh, this becomes evident when we read the epistle of First Clement. First Clement was written around 95 through 97 AD. Uh, Clement wrote to the congregation at Corinth to bring an end to the schism there. Uh, the exact nature of that division in Corinth is unknown. However, 1 Clement 3.3 describes the schism in general terms, saying, So people were stirred up, those without honor against the honor, those of no repute against the highly reputed, the foolish against the wise, the young against the old. So the word translated old here is presbyteros in Greek, uh, and although it should not be translated as priest, uh, because it stands in opposition to hoinioi, the young, uh, the use of presbyteros here alludes to the nature of the conflict that he's going to flesh out a bit more as he goes, as he continues writing. So Clement writes in chapter 44, verse 6, For we see that you have removed certain people, their good conduct notwithstanding, from the ministry, the late or young, that had been held in honor by them blamelessly. The nature of the conflict is defined further in chapter 47, verse 6. It is disgraceful, dear friends, yes, utterly disgraceful and unworthy of your conduct in Christ, that it should be reported that the well-established and ancient church of the Corinthians, because of one or two persons, is rebelling against its presbyters. The conflict in Corinth, then, based on 1 Clement, is that a small number of young men had succeeded in deposing the appointed presbyters. Uh, and, we, and we note as well here, uh, let's see, footnotes 20, oh, excuse me, I'm getting ahead of myself here. Uh, at, at this point, we continue, uh, this is where we see in Clement what, he, what we witness in the Holy Scriptures regarding this fluidity between the office of bishop and presbyter. In 47.6, Clement describes the conflict as a rebellion against its presbyters. In 44.4, he writes, it is no small sin for us if we depose from the bishop's office those who have offered the gifts blamelessly uh, and in a mature, uh, bl blameless and holiness. Uh, blessed are those presbyters who have gone on ahead, who took their departure at a mature and fruitful age, for they no longer fear, they, they, for they need no longer fear that someone may remove them from their established place. The men removed from office were presbyters who held the bishop's office. And the footnote there is, is helpful. Francis Sullivan notes that at this time in Corinth, uh, as in most places at this time, uh, that the, church, the ministry had not yet developed into a mon-episcopate, uh, meaning you did not have one bishop in a town, but you rather had, had multiple ones then. Just, so just as uh, episcopos and presbyter is still basically the same at this point. The only reason given by Clement for, his, for this rebellion was jealousy in 3 verse 4. The antidote he prescribes for the Corinthian congregations is humility, repentance, and obedience to the duly appointed presbyter, 52.2. The reason that jealousy, schism, and the resulting deposition of the presbyters is sinful is that the office of the ministry, whether called by the name of bishop or presbyter, is part of God's order. He writes in chapter 42, The apostles received the gospel from us, from for us, excuse me. The apostles received the gospel for us from the Lord Jesus Christ. Jesus the Christ was sent forth from God. So then Christ is from God and the apostles are from Christ. Both, therefore, came of the will of God in good order, having therefore received their orders and being fully assured by the resurrection of the Lord Jesus Christ and full of faith in the word of God, they went forth with the firm assurance that the Holy Spirit gives, preaching the good news that the kingdom of God was about to come. So preaching both in the country and in the towns, they appointed their first fruits when they attested them by the Spirit 
to be bishops and deacons for the future believers. And this was no new thing they did. For indeed, uh, something had been written about bishops and deacons many years ago. For somewhere, says the scripture, I will appoint their bishops in righteousness and their deacons in faith. God established this order by sending the Lord Jesus Christ, who then gave the apostles the gospel and sent them into the world in order to preach it. The apostles then appoint their first fruits as bishops and deacons. As both Christ and his apostles came of the will of God in good order, the appointment of bishops and deacons then continues to be the will of God for good order. Clement finds in this order, the fulfillment of prophecy, specifically Isaiah 6, uh, chapter 60, verse 17, I will also make your officers peace and your magistrates righteousness. And, and he's, he's reading the Septuagint here. And so in the Septuagint, Clement replaces uh, Archontos with Episcopus in the first cola and Episcopus with uh, Diaconon in the second cola. So regardless of whether or not Clement's rereading of deacons into the words of the prophet is legitimate or not, he finds a clear Old Testament promise that the Lord will give episcopos uh, to his people in righteousness. Clement then demonstrates from Old Testament prophecy that this divine order has been foretold by God. The divine order and appointment of bishops and deacons is also shown forth in Old Testament type. Clement spends the next chapter, 43, uh, recounting the story of the budding of Aaron's rod from Numbers chapter 17. In that chapter, men of Israel had caused strife uh, with their jealousy of Aaron. The budding of Aaron's staff demonstrated to all of Israel that God has entrusted his ministry to Aaron and his sons. For Clement, this prefigures God's appointment of bishops and deacons in the church for his ministry. For all the discontinuities between the Levitical priesthood and the ministry of the New Testament, the continuity that Clement draws out is that God establishes an order that he wishes Christians to follow. It is through this divinely established order, namely that the bishops and deacons are the successors of the apostles, that God uses to maintain unity over against strife. He writes in chapter 44, Our apostles likewise knew through our Lord Jesus Christ, that there would be strife over the bishop's office. For this reason, therefore, having received complete foreknowledge, they appointed the leaders mentioned earlier, and afterwards they gave the offices a permanent character. That is, if they should die, other approved men should succeed to their ministry. These, therefore, who were appointed by them, or later on by other reputable men with the consent of the whole church, and who have ministered to the flock of Christ blamelessly, humbly, peaceably, and unselfishly, and for a long time have been well spoken of by all, these we consider to be unjustly removed from their ministry. For it will be no small sin for us if we depose from the bishop's office those who have offered the gifts blamelessly and in holiness. The reason the apostles appointed bishops and deacons was their foreknowledge of the strife to come in the future. For the sake of maintaining order in the church, the offices were given a permanent character, and the office then outlasts the man appointed to it, so that when the incumbent of the office dies, other approved men will succeed those who were who originally appointed. The removal of these men in the congregation at Corinth is therefore a sin against the order that God has established in his church. Unlike the Didache, 1 Clement describes the office of the ministry in terms of bishop, presbyter, and deacon. However, the functions and duties of each grade within the office are not clearly defined as they later would become in church history. Throughout 1 Clement, the offices of bishop and presbyter appear to be synonymous. Uh, any difference in duty and function is only alluded to by the difference in the titles themselves. This brings us then to the ministry in Ignatius' epistles. Within this context, from the other documents, or these two other documents in the Corpus of the Apostolic Fathers, and we could look at other of the documents in that corpus as well, as the, specifically the Shepherd of Hermas would give us a good idea of what's happening with the office of the ministry and the Episcopate at Rome uh, during that time as well. 
But as we, as, we can, as we look at all this context, then, we can now turn to the office of the ministry in the epistles of St. Ignatius. And he devotes considerable space in six of the seven epistles to the office of bishop, um, often but not always accompanied by references to the council of presbyters and the deacons. Now, and we note six of the seven epistles, uh, because the epistle to the Romans is the only epistle where Ignatius doesn't make an exhortation regardless, regarding the office of the ministry. He uses the word bishop twice in that epistle, uh, but that's just simply not what he's dealing with. Uh, his epistle to the Romans is a different animal, no pun intended. So the final letter of the Ignatian Corpus then is even addressed to Ignatius' younger contemporary, Polycarp, who is the bishop of Smyrna. And in that epistle, the elder bishop gives the younger bishop instructions in the fulfillment of his office. Throughout Ignatius' teaching about the office of the ministry, the dual theme is one office of the ministry and the centrality of the bishop to the unity of the church. As often as Ignatius stresses the unity of the bishop, presbyters, and deacons, he confesses the unitary nature of the office of the ministry by stressing the centrality of the bishop to the church's unity. He simultaneously stresses the hierarchical nature of the grades within the one office of the ministry. So within the one office of the ministry, there is a grade which is responsible specifically for the unity of the clergy and the churches. Ignatius speaks of the unity of the one, of the one bishop and the presbyters when he writes in Ephesians 2.2. 2. It is proper, therefore, in every way to glorify Jesus Christ who has glorified you, so that you joined together in a united obedience and subject to the bishop and the council of presbyters may be sanctified in every respect. The laity are to obey both the bishop and the council of presbyters. He urges the same obedience towards the end of the epistle in Ephesians 20, verse 2. All of you, individually and collectively, gathered together in grace by name in one faith and one Jesus Christ, who physically was a descendant of David, who is son of man and son of God, in order that you may obey the bishop and the council of presbyters with an undisturbed mind, breaking one bread, which is the medicine of immortality. The antidote we take in order not to die, but to live forever in Jesus Christ. He writes in Magnesian 7.1, Therefore, as the Lord did nothing without the Father, either by himself or through the apostles, for he is united with him, so you must not do anything without the bishop and the presbyters. He exhorts the Trollians. Be subject to the bishop as to the commandment, and likewise to the council of presbyters. He writes in Philadelphians 7, verse 1, I called out when I was with you. I was speaking with a loud voice, God's voice. Pay attention to the bishop, the council of presbyters, and the deacons. From these passages... It is clear that obedience is due not only to the bishop, but to the presbyters and deacons as well. The laity owe the bishop, presbyters, and deacons obedience uh, as well as respect. He writes to the Trollians in Trollians uh, 2, 2 through 3, verse 1. It is essential, therefore, that you continue your current practice and do nothing without the bishop, but be subject also to the council of presbyters as to the apostles of Jesus Christ, our hope in whom we shall be found if we so live. Furthermore, it is necessary that those who are deacons of the mysteries of Jesus Christ please everyone in every respect. For they are not merely deacons of food and drink, but ministers of God's church. Therefore, they must avoid criticism as though it were fire. Similarly, let everyone respect the deacons as Jesus Christ, just as they should respect the bishop, who is a model of the Father, and the presbyters as God's counsel, and as the band of the apostles. Without these, no group can be called a church. The laity are to do nothing without the bishop. They are to be subject to the presbyters and respect the deacons. And again, the unity of the office of the ministry is demonstrated in the fact that the deacons should be respected just as they should respect the bishop. We also see in this passage why Ignatius holds the church's ministers in such high regard. They are God's, or they are representatives of God, Jesus Christ, and the apostles. The presbyters are likened to the apostles of Jesus Christ. Uh, the bishop is a model, a, a tip on of the Father. And the presbyters are as the band of the apostles. 
This is similar to what Ignatius writes in Magnesian 6.1. Be eager to do everything in godly harmony. The bishops presiding in the place of God and the presbyters in the place of the council, the apostles and the deacons, who are especially dear to me, since they have been entrusted with the ministry of Jesus Christ, who before the ages was with the Father and appeared at the end of time. Here, the bishop is in the place of God, the presbyters in the place of the apostles, the deacons are entrusted with the ministry of Christ. In Smyrnians 8.1, the bishop must be followed as Christ followed the Father. Now, the presbyters are to be followed as the apostles. The deacons, however, are to be respected as the commandment of God. Robert Grant clarifies, respect for the deacons is also important, for their commands are equivalent to God's. As representatives of God, the apostles and Christ, and speaking in the stead and by the command of God, the incumbents of the office of the ministry, regardless of their grade, are to be obeyed and respected. When we put Ignatius' analogy of the clergy to, to God and his appointed representatives, uh, we see that it doesn't seem, though, quite right by our standards. The bishop is analogous to God. Magnesians 6.1 is analogous also to the grace of God in Magnesians 2.1, or to the Father, Magnesians 3.1 and Trollians 3, Smyrna's 8. He's also uh, analogous to the Lord, to Jesus Christ in Trollians 2, verse 1, and to the commandment. The presbyters are analogous to the apostles. Deacons are analogous to Jesus Christ. We would expect the, presb the presbyters to be compared to Christ, uh, and the deacons to be compared to them with the apostles. Grant notes, however, this sequence is rather strange. We should not expect the presbyters to be inferior in regard to the analogy to the deacons. It would appear that the bishop and the deacons are one strand of development, the presbyters another. This, uh, just by way of explanation, this is something that we've discussed just a bit in, uh, in class is that uh, in most, most scholarship assumes two different strands of development of the office of the ministry uh, to where you have uh, St. Paul and Luke describing the ministry in terms of bishops and deacons and uh, John using the term presbyter. Uh, now, this doesn't hold up, however, because St. Paul also uses the word presbyter uh, when he's discussing the... Uh, the elders, the presbyters in Acts chapter 20, and then, of course, then the pastoral, ep pastoral epistles. has uh, uh, First Timothy and Titus then have the uh, qualifications for bishops and deacons, but also then uh, speaks about the presbyters who labor among you in the word. That just by way of explanation of this different strand of development, uh, Grant is arguing, as many do, that then these two strands start to become intertwined with Ignatius. Grant works under the commonly held assumption that uh, with which we would disagree. A Pauline strand of development of the office consists of presbyters and a Johannine strand, which consists of bishops as representatives of the churches. Oh, I had that backwards. The inconsistency with the analogy does not necessarily mean that there are different strands of the development of the office of the ministry, though. More than likely, Ignatius' epistles demonstrate the opposite. Perhaps there had been fluidity within the office, I and mean, after all, St. Paul mentioned specific grades of the ministry in Ephesians 4.11, Yet Ignatius' point is the same as St. Paul's. Each grade within the office held the power and authority of the office. Any differences in function between the grades of bishop, presbyter, and deacon existed by human argument for the sake of maintaining order within the church. As we turn to the idea of the centrality of the bishop for the unity of the church, it's important to note that for Ignatius, the bishop always represents God the Father, the source of the Godhead. The centrality and primacy of the bishop over the presbyters and deacons is demonstrated by the bishop's oversight of doctrine and worship. Ignatius continues in the second half of Smyrnians 8.1, let no one do anything that has to do with the church without the bishop. Only that Eucharist which is under the authority of the bishop or whomever he himself designates is to be considered valid. Whenever the bishop appears, there let the congregation be. Just as wherever Jesus Christ is, there is the Catholic Church. And of course, this is the first time in written uh, Christian history that we have the word uh, Catholicos, describing the church. Christians, along with presbyters and deacons then, 
are not to do anything without the bishop, especially the Eucharist, because without the bishop, or the one whom the bishop has appointed or designated, the Eucharist is invalid. This is not necessarily a nod to what would become Roman apostolic succession, but rather a confession that in the scriptures, it is the ministers alone who celebrate the Lord's Supper as stewards of the mysteries of God. Ignatius adds to our understanding of what this means in Philadelphians 4.1. Take care, therefore, to participate in one Eucharist, for there is one flesh of our Lord Jesus Christ and one cup that leads to unity through his blood. There is one altar, just as there is one bishop, together with the council of presbyters and deacons, my fellow servants, in order that whatever you do, you do it in accordance with God. He is not saying, in Smyrnians 8.1, that presbyters and deacons are not to celebrate the Eucharist. Rather, they are the ones the bishop appoints because of their unity with the one bishop. It's important to remember at this point, that at this point in church history, every parish had a bishop, presbyters, and deacons. And so the reason for participating only in one Eucharist presided over by the bishop or his appointee was to make sure that one would celebrate the sacrament in accordance with God. Those assemblies which gathered for the Eucharist, apart from the bishop's approval, were sectarian. Ignatius mentions these gatherings in Smyrnians 6 too. Now note well those who hold heretical opinions about the grace of Jesus Christ that came to us. Note how contrary they are to the mind of God. They have no concern for love, none for the widow, none for the orphan, none for the oppressed, none for the prisoner or the one released, none for the hungry or the thirsty. They abstain from Eucharist and prayer because they refuse to acknowledge that the Eucharist is the flesh of our Lord, of our Savior Jesus Christ, which suffered for our sins and which the Father, by his goodness, raised up. Those who hold heretical opinions here are the Docetists. This is evident from the reason for their abstention from the Eucharist. They refuse to believe that it was Christ's true body and blood, which suffered for our sins and was raised up, because they did not believe that Christ had true flesh and blood. This is evident from Ignatius' warning in Smyrna 7 2. It is proper, therefore, to avoid such people and not to speak about them, either privately or publicly. Do not pay attention, or do pay attention, however, excuse me, to the prophets, and especially in the gospel uh, in which the passion has been made clear to us and the resurrection has been accomplished. The Docetists denied the real presence of Christ in the Lord's Supper because they denied the Lord's real corporeal presence during his earthly ministry. We see in Ignatius' words about the Eucharist a confession also been against the sacramentarians, who, since the time of the Reformation, deny Christ's real presence in the Eucharist, though for different reasons than second century Docetists. Ignatius reminds us that our view of the sacrament is inextricably bound together with our Christology. Looking at the footnote, uh, Ignatius' words in Romans 7.3 are another early witness to the real presence of Christ in the Eucharist. He writes, I take no pleasure in corruptible food or in the pleasures of this life. I want the bread of God, which is the flesh of Christ, who is of the seed of David. And for drink, I want his blood, which is incorruptible love. Ignatius clearly teaches one office of the ministry with three grades within that one office. The office of the ministry, regardless of the grade, is apostolic in nature. The distinction between the grades is purely for the sake of maintaining order, concord, and unity. Ignatius clearly believes the one who holds the office of oversight, the bishop, is chiefly responsible for maintaining godly harmony. To impress the idea of godly harmony upon the clergy and laity of the churches to which he's writing in these epistles... Ignatius employs two metaphors. Both metaphors uh, echo metaphors found in Holy Scripture, while simultaneously echoing a cultural phenomenon in which, uh, with which Ignatius' hearers would have also been familiar. The first is the metaphor of the lyre, found in the Epistle to the Ephesians, and the second is the metaphor of the coin, found in the Epistle to the Magnesians. To best understand the metaphor of the lyre in Ephesians 4, we must begin with Ephesians 3, verse 2. Ephesians 3, verse 2 serves as the thesis for the entire epistle. There Ignatius writes, But since love does not allow me to be silent concerning you, I have therefore taken the initiative to encourage you so that you may run together in harmony with the mind of God. 
For Jesus Christ, our inseparable life, is the mind of the Father, just as the bishops appointed throughout the world are the mind of Christ. The church is to run together in the mind of God. The mind of God the Father is Jesus Christ, and the appointed bishop is the mind of Christ. The bishop is a representative of Christ, who himself is a representative of the Father. In order for Christians to run together in the mind of God, they must be united in mind with the bishop. Ignatius' preference uh, for the term gnome is noteworthy here. Often translated as mind, its meaning encompasses unity of purpose and, and being in one concord, or being in one accord. Excuse me. St. Paul employs the word in this way in 1 Corinthians 1 verse 10 when he writes, Now I plead with you, brethren, by the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, that you all speak the same thing, and that there be no divisions among you, but that you be perfectly joined together in the same mind and in the same judgment. St. John uses the word to describe the unity of mind of the ten kings, which give their power to the beast in Revelation 17, 13. The word gnome also has long use in the political arena. John Paul Lotz notes that Ignatius' use of running together in harmony with the mind of God points to just such a politicized use of a term common in political affair, not only since the days of Demosthenes and Isocrates, but more recently in Plutarch and Aristides as well. In exhorting the Ephesians to run together in harmony with the mind of God, Ignatius is, an, is employing an image that is both scriptural and cultural. Ignatius employs the imagery of running together, again in the next chapter, where he draws out the imagery into a full cultural metaphor of unity, which would have been significant to his hearers in Southwest Asia Minor. The Bishop of Syria writes in Ephesians 4, verses 1 and 2. Thus it is proper for you to run together in harmony with the mind of the bishop, as you are in fact doing. For your council of presbyters, which is worthy of its name and worthy of God, is attuned to the bishop as strings to the lyre. Therefore, in your unanimity and harmonious love, Jesus Christ is sung. You must join this chorus, every one of you, so that being harmonious in unanimity and taking your pitch from God, you may sing in unison with one voice through Jesus Christ to the Father, in order that he may both hear you and on the basis of what you do well, acknowledge you as members of his Son. It is therefore advantageous for you to be in perfect unity, in order that you may always have a share in God. The metaphor itself, or the metaphor of itself, then produces the notion of unity. Strings must be attuned to the lyre, otherwise they produce a discordant sound. Unity is necessary for the lyre to produce a pleasant melody. The chorus then takes its pitch from the lyre so that everyone in the chorus may sing in unison. As it is with a lyre and chorus, so it is with Christ's church. The council of presbyters is attuned to the bishops as strings to a lyre. The Ephesian presbyters are unified with the mind of their bishop in concord and harmony. The chorus, consisting of the Ephesian Christians then, takes its pitch from the concord and harmony of the presbyters with the bishop. The Ephesian church sings in unison with one voice through Jesus Christ to the Father in order that he may both hear them and acknowledge them as members of his Son. In order for the church to offer a singular voice of praise to the Father through Christ Jesus, presbyters and parishioners must be attuned with the mind of the bishop, who is in the mind of Christ. The metaphor makes sense in and of itself. A lyre with discordant strings will not be harmonious, and a chorus could not take its pitch from the lyre. Then. The idea of concord and harmony in the church is not a new concept to Ignatius, uh, nor is the use of metaphors of unity. Uh, St. Paul's epistles contain many calls for unity within the churches. One that seems to have significance for Ignatius is St. Paul's epistle to the Ephesians, chapter 4, verses 1 through 16. Paul urges the Ephesians to keep the unity of the Spirit in the bond of peace. Rather than being tossed about by every wind of doctrine, 
the apostle prayed that they may grow up in all things into him who is the head, Christ, from whom the whole body, joined and knit together by him, uh, excuse me, may grow up in all things to him who is the head, Christ, from whom the whole body, joined and knit together by what every, by what every joint supplies, according to the effective working by which every part does its share, causes growth of the body for the edifying of itself in love. As a body consists of different parts which work harmoniously together, or ideally do so, so Christians are to maintain that same unity in Christ via unity in the pure doctrine and grow and edify itself in love. Clement in Rome, whom we have mentioned earlier, uh, similarly exhorts the Corinthian Christians to harmony, not by employing a metaphor, but by the example of the holy angels' harmony with God. He writes in 1 Clement 34, Let our boasting and our confidence be in him. Let us submit ourselves to his will. Let us consider the whole host of his angels, how they stand by and serve his will. For the scripture says, 10,000 times 10,000 stood by him, and thousands of thousands served him. And they cried out, Holy, holy, holy is the Lord of hosts. All creation is full of his glory. Let us also then, being gathered together in harmony, with intentness of heart, cry out to him earnestly, with one mouth, so that we may come to share in his great and glorious promises. Clement's example of the holy angels resembles Ignatius' musical metaphor in two ways. First, the angels are gathered together in harmony with intentness of heart. Second, the angels cry out to God earnestly with one mouth. The holy angels, whose number is 10,000 times 10,000, serve as an example to which the Corinthians are to strive. Clement encourages them to gather together in harmony with intenseness of heart so that they might confess God and praise him with one mouth. The angels sing in concord, or as Ignatius encouraged the Ephesians to do, in unison with one voice. Thus Ignatius' musical metaphor alludes to St. Paul as well as Clement's exhortations to unity. John Paul Lotz, however, argues that Ignatius' musical metaphor would have also had significant cultural significance for the Ephesian Christians. Understanding the cultural significance of the metaphor will demonstrate how Ignatius not only viewed the unity of the church, but viewed the church's role in the world. Lots comments. We also hear echoes that, pay, that uh, pagan revival embodied in the... Excuse me here. We also hear echoes... Uh, I, I've missed a word here in the quotation. And I don't, it's been three years since I read this, so I don't think I'm going to remember what it was. We also hear echoes that pagan revival embodied in the worship of the Roman emperors. We'll let that slide for now. The court, yeah. <laughs> All errors are my own. <laughs> the chorus sings to the lyre, both tuned to the gods, leaders, elders, and worshipers, all reflect the unity and harmony secured for them by the deity and demanded of them by the guarantor of their security. The imperial cult consisted of chorus, which was made up of influential members of a city. So the chorus sang hymns, offered sacrifices to the gods on behalf of the emperor, and officiated over festivals and feasts. The cultic worship celebrated helped maintain harmony between citizens and cities. So the, the, the pagan worship and, and the emperor cult then is something that does this similar where they have this chorus attuned to a lyre. They're, they're often marching in procession uh, within cities, sometimes from one city to another, depending upon the occasion. And they're singing hymns, offering sacrifices, etc. Ignatius' hearers in Ephesus may have heard in his lyre metaphor an intentional contrast between the cults, of the, the cults of the emperor and the church's worship of Christ. Instead of citizens of provincial cities gathering in imperial temples, Christians gather in churches. Instead of pagan deities granting harmony among the citizens and cities by which strife and war was avoided, the harmony of the Christian faith was that by which all warfare among those in heaven and on those on earth is abolished. As the Romans maintained political harmony through the imperial cult in the Greek provinces, the church was to maintain doctrinal harmony 
for the sake of abolishing strife and maintaining peace in the church. Several scholars point out here, uh, point out that here is where Ignatius uh, would find additional significance for his martyrdom in Rome. Part of the duty of the chorus was to perform the sacrifice. In Romans 2, verse 2, Ignatius makes it clear that he views his impending martyrdom as just that. He writes, Grant me nothing more than to be poured out as an offering to God while there is still an altar ready, so that in love you may form a chorus and sing to the Father in Jesus Christ, because God has judged the bishop from Syria worthy to be found in the West, having summoned him from the East. It is good to be setting from the world to God in order that I may rise to him. For Ignatius, his own march to death from Syria to Rome resembles a worship procession, not to the emperor, but to the true God. It consists of a procession, a sacrifice, an altar, and a chorus, which consists in the Christians of the Christians who have come to meet him and carry him, so to speak, to the altar for sacrifice. He writes in Ephesians 9, verse 2, So you are all participants together in, the share, in shared worship, God-bearers and temple-bearers, Christ-bearers, bearers of holy things, adorned in every respect with the commandments of Jesus Christ. As the chorus bore various holy things, so the Ephesians carried with them holy things as Ignatius. The God-bearer proceeded a process towards his death. Ignatius may be making a play on his epithet, uh, Theophorus, since members of the imperial chorus were called Theophoroi, images of each city's god. Or they, rather, they carried these, uh, as well as in the goddess of Amanoia. In Trollians 3, verse 1, he calls the bishop a model of the father. The image of a unified and harmonious choir present, uh, processing with their sacrifice towards the altar paints a countercultural picture of the church in the early 2nd century, century A.D. Whereas the imperial cult was concerned with political harmony, though the church's unanimity and harmonious love resulted in the confession and praise of Christ Jesus. Another instance where Ignatius describes the centrality of the bishop to the unity and harmony of the church is Magnesians chapters 5 and 6. He writes, Seeing then that all things have an end, Two things together lie before us, death and life, and everyone will go to his own place. For just as there are two coinages, the one of God and the other of the world, and each of them has its own stamp impressed upon it, so the unbelievers bear the stamp of this world, but the faithful in love bear the stamp of God, the Father, through Jesus Christ, whose life is not in us unless we voluntarily choose to die into his suffering. Ignatius' use of the coinage metaphor closely resembles Jesus' use of the same metaphor in Matthew 22, 20. Asking whose image and inscription is this, Jesus points out that which bears Caesar's image belongs to Caesar, while that which bears God's image through faith belongs to God. Ignatius combines the coinage metaphor with the teaching of the two ways, which was a common pedagogical tool used in the Epistle of Barnabas, uh, the Didache, and then uh, first century uh, Judaism as well. The unbelievers, according to the two ways, the unbelievers walk in the way of death, having the world's stamp impressed upon them. Christians walk in the way of life, having received the stamp of God. John Paul Lotz envisions that Ignatius is using the familiar coinage metaphor not only to recall the Savior's words, but also to refer to homonoia coins of Asia Minor that were current at the time. Greek cities often fought with one another for the title of Asia's first city. Uh, in fact, uh, well, we'll get to that in a moment. Lotz argues that the Magnesians, living about 14 miles away from Ephesus, they would have been familiar with these homonia coins issued between Ephesus, Smyrna, and Paramon during Domitian's reign. The rivalry between the larger cities also affected the smaller cities, such as Magnesia and Nyssa, from, uh, for fighting over such titles as sixth or seventh city in Asia. Homonoia coins were minted uh, to assuage rival cities in their battles over meaningless titles and imagined glory. Ignatius continues in Magnesian 6 1. Since, therefore, in the persons mentioned above, I have by faith seen and loved the whole congregation, I have this advice Be eager to do everything in godly harmony, 
the bishop presiding in the place of God and the presbyters presiding in the place of the Council of the Apostles and the deacons who are especially dear to me since they have been entrusted with the ministry of Jesus Christ who before the ages was with the Father and appeared at the end of time. For Ignatius, godly concord means respecting and submitting to those who hold the office of the ministry, the bishop, the presbyters, and the deacons. What this concord looks like is described in 6, 2 through 7, 1. Let all, therefore, accept the same attitude as God and respect one another. And let no one regard his neighbor in merely human terms, but in Jesus Christ love one another always. Let there be nothing among you that is capable of dividing you. But be united with the bishop and with those who lead as an example and lesson of incorruptibility. Therefore, as the Lord did nothing without the Father, either by himself or through the apostles, for he was united with them, so you must not do anything without the bishop and the presbyters. Do not convince yourself, uh, do not attempt to convince yourself that anything done apart from the others is right. But gathering together, let there be one prayer, one petition, one mind, one hope, with love and blameless joy which is Jesus Christ, than whom nothing is better. The language of unity, one prayer, one petition, one mind, one hope, with love and blameless joy, resembles not only St. Paul's Ephesians 4, verse 1 through 6, but it also resembles popular notions stamped on harmonia coins of the era. Ignatius concludes his instructions on harmony in Magnesian 7, 2, where he writes, Let all of you run together as to one temple of God, as to one altar, and to one Jesus Christ, who came forth from one Father and remained with the one and returned to the one. This connects this section with the imperial cult procession imagery used in Ephesians 4, 1 and 2, and allows us to surmise that Ignatius may well have appropriated the image of these uh, harmony coins as an image of unity around the threefold office of the ministry of the church. Even if this is not the case, Ignatius clearly envisions the office of the ministry, especially the office of oversight, as the constitutive factor for unity, or for church unity. That that unity is chiefly doctrinal is evident in that Ignatius spends chapters 8 through 11 then teaching against the Judaizers and Docetists. Chapters 12 and 13 bookend the defense of the true doctrine with another call to be firmly grounded in the precepts of the Lord and the apostles, together with your most distinguished bishop, and that beautifully woven spiritual crown, which is your council of presbyters and the godly deacons. Again, the Magnesians are reminded in 13.2, be subject to the bishop and to one another, as Jesus Christ in the flesh was with the Father, was, uh, the Father, and the apostles were to Christ and to the Father, that there may be unity, both physical and spiritual. For Ignatius, the bishop is the guardian and custodian of unity, physical and spiritual, which we would call doctrinal. The goal of homonoia in the church, the goal of homonoia with a bishop. In the Roman world of the first century and into the second century AD, concord was maintained by unity with the emperor and participation in the imperial cult. Concord was simply a political tool to encourage communal harmony between rival cities and provinces within the empire. For Ignatius, Concord was not merely a political buzzword to encourage external harmony between the churches. Concord consisted of shared beliefs and served two purposes. The first was protection from heresy. Ignatius writes in Ephesians 6, 2. Now Onesimus himself highly praises your orderly conduct in God, reporting that you all live in accordance with the truth and that no heresy is found a home among you. Indeed, you do not so much as listen to anyone unless he speaks truthfully about Jesus Christ. Unity with the bishop is manifested in listening solely to the bishop's teaching. It is also manifested by receiving the Eucharist from the bishop or from the bishop's appointed representative. To put it in our own vocabulary, unity with the bishop protects the church against heresy and sectarian teaching and manifests itself around a common reception of the Lord's Supper. The second purpose of concord with the bishop, according to Ignatius, is to live in God's way. Unity with the bishop reflects the unity of the Godhead and unity with God the Father. Ignatius viewed submission to the bishop as an enfleshment of the unity between the Father and the Son. He expounds upon this in Magnesians 13. Be eager, therefore, 
to be firmly grounded in the precepts of the Lord and apostles. And we should note the Greek for precepts is actually dogma here. In order that whatever you do, you may prosper physically and spiritually by faith and love in the Son and in the, and the Father and in the Spirit, in the beginning and at the end, together with your most distinguished bishop and that beautifully woven spiritual crown, which is your council of presbyters and godly deacons. Be subject to the bishop and, one, and to one another, as Jesus Christ in the flesh was to the Father, and the apostles were to Christ and to the Father, that there may be unity, both physical and spiritual. Lots summarizes Ignatius' thought. Unity with one another and with the bishop was akin to the unity between Jesus Christ and the Father. And possessing an undivided spirit as a community could be identified with the unity of Jesus Christ himself. This incarnational concord is not only a reflection on divine concord, it was divine concord. Ignatius writes in Philadelphians 8.1, I was doing my part, therefore, as a man set on unity. But God does not dwell where there is division and anger. The Lord, however, forgives all who repent, if in repenting they return to the unity of God and the counsel of the bishop. In this verse, the unity of God and the counsel of the bishop are synonymous because the bishop is the mind of Christ, and Christ is the mind of God the Father, as we saw in Ephesians 3, verse 2. Concord with the bishop and each other represented in earthly relations a heavenly reality. For the Roman, concord was maintained but also expressed through participation in the imperial cult. For Ignatius, concord is epitomized in the common worship and the common reception of the Lord's Supper. He encourages the Ephesians to gather in unity with the clergy, with an undisturbed mind breaking one bread, which is the medicine of immortality, and the antidote we take in order not to die but live forever in Jesus Christ. He tells the Philadelphians, take care, therefore, to participate in one Eucharist, for there is one flesh of our Lord Jesus Christ, and one cup that leads to unity through his blood. There is one altar, just as there is one bishop, together with the council of presbyters and the deacons, my fellow servants, in order that whatever you do, you do in accordance with God. There was not merely, this was not merely a political or external concord Ignatius sought within and between the churches. It was true concord in belief and confession. Why is Ignatius' witness to the grades of the Office of the Ministry so important for us today? The Lutheran reformers sought to retain this ancient model of ecclesiastical government. Philip Melanchthon confessed in the Apology of the Augsburg Confession that the Lutherans are most willing to assist in maintaining the old ecclesiastical regulations and Episcopal government, which is called Canonica Politia, uh, provided the bishops would tolerate our doctrine and receive our priests. The Lutheran Reformation sought to conserve man-made institutions, even the grades of the office of the ministry. The Lutheran Confessions also confessed that by divine right there is no distinction between bishops and presbyters. Melanchthon, writing in the treatise on the power and primacy of the Pope, states, Jerome declares in distinct terms that bishops and presbyters are not different, but that all clergymen are alike bishops and priests, and he produces the declaration of Paul to Titus, in 1 verse 5 and 6, in which he says, For this cause I left thee at Crete, that thou shouldest set in order the things that are wanting, and ordain elders in every city. And afterwards he calls these bishops. A bishop must be blameless, husband of one wife. 1 Timothy 3, 2. So Peter and John call themselves presbyters, or priests. By divine right, all pastors are bishops because they exercise oversight over the doctrine and life of their flocks. Johann Gerhard, the art theologian of the Evangelical Lutheran Church, teaches this in his Logi on the Ministry. He writes, In the holy writings of the New Testament, the word bishop is assigned in general to all who perform the teaching office in the church. For since they have been placed as bishop by the Holy Spirit to feed the church of God, Acts 2.28, and since they are commanded to feed the flock of God, that is in their charge, exercising oversight. Therefore, they are rightly and deservedly called bishops because of this overseeing of the flock entrusted to them. Although Lutherans teach that all presbyters are bishops in this broad sense, both Melanchthon and Gerhard teach the office of the bishop is distinct from the office of presbyter in a narrow sense. Melanchthon writes in the treatise, these words immediately following the quotation cited above. 
Afterwards, Jerome further declares, the practice of choosing one who should be placed over the others was introduced that schisms might be prevented, that one might not draw a church to himself here and another there, and thus separate the church. For at Alexandria, he says, from Mark the Evangelist to Heraclius and Dionysus, the presbyters have always elected one from among themselves, esteemed him more highly, and called him Episcopus, bishop, precisely as the military elected captain, and his deacons elected one from among themselves who qualified for the duties whom they called the archdeacon. For, tell me, what more does a bishop perform than a presbyter, except to ordain others to ecclesial office? Jerome here teaches that this difference between bishops and pastors originated from human regulations alone, as we actually observe in practice. For the office and the authority are entirely the same, but in subsequent time, the mode of ordination alone was made the distinction between bishops and pastors. For it was afterwards thus determined that a bishop should ordain pastors, or ordain persons, excuse me, to the duties of the ministry in other churches also. In Jerome's comments, the purpose of choosing a bishop echoes Ignatius' call for unity and concord with the bishop. Namely, the schisms ought to be prevented, that one might not draw a church to himself here and another there, and thus separate the church. The office of oversight was established specifically to maintain the ministers of the word in doctrinal unity. This distinction between bishop and presbyters originated from human regulations alone, for the office and the authority are entirely the same. With the, ex which, with the exception of ordination, which was assigned to bishops for the sake of good order. Gerhard expands upon this in his Logi on the Ministry, writing, However, to nurture good order and concord in the church, there formally was established a sort of distinction among those pastors that some were entrusted not only with oversight over the flock entrusted to them, but also over other pastors and presbyters. As a result, it happened that the title bishop was attributed in a specific sense to those pastors who had the oversight over other teachers. Traces of that meaning are extant in the Greek translations of Numbers 31.14, 2 Kings 11.18, Nehemiah 11.12, as we have shown earlier. Whereas presbyters exercised oversight over their flocks, the bishop exercised oversight over the pastors and presbyters. Thus, in one sense, all pastors are bishops and can therefore ordain their parish by divine right, but in a narrow sense, only those pastors who are elected to the Episcopal office are bishops, exercise oversight over other pastors, and perform ordinations by human right for the sake of maintaining order against schism within his area of jurisdiction. Ignatius' language for the ministry is not as defined as it would be in the 15th and 16th centuries. However, there is remarkable similarity between the Lutheran language of the grades of the office and Ignatius' second century language. Ignatius rightly believed that the false teachings of his day were threats to the church. They were such great threats because they led to discord and division within the church. He encourages the Philadelphians, flee therefore the evil tricks and traps of the ruler of this age, lest you be worn out by his schemes and grow weak in love. Instead, gather together all of you with an undivided heart. Unity of doctrine and life, which is the undivided heart that Ignatius encourages, is the goal of Episcopal polity. That undivided heart, fervent love for the pure doctrine of Christ and the brethren, is a rarity today. The pastors of the Eldona recognize that a truly evangelical episcopacy is set forth as the preferred polity of the evangelical Lutheran Church as taught in the Lutheran Confessions. Recognizing this, the founders of the diocese restored the offices of bishop, presbyter, and deacon within the one divinely established office of the ministry. The reestablishment of the Episcopal office confessed against the democratic mindset that pervades American Lutheran church bodies. The Episcopal office also visibly expresses Catholicity much in the same way as the use of the historic lectionary calendar investments do. The bishop, as it was in the scripture, and in the days of Ignatius, is a grade within the one office of the ministry. Since it is a man-made grade within the office, the bishop's office does not have a term limit. The Episcopal office also fosters unity among the pastors and deacons of the diocese in three ways. The first is ordination, as we read in the treatise above. 
The charter of the diocese states, we shall endeavor to express our unity by having the bishop perform all ordinations and installations within the diocese, except as he shall otherwise authorize. Since ordination is the public ratification of the divine call, the bishop oversees the call process as well as the education and examination of candidates for ordination and membership into the diocese. Though he allows the Council of Presbyters to be involved in this process, again, for the sake of unity. The second way the Episcopal office engenders unity is in the bishop's oversight of the pastor's doctrine and life. This is done through the disciplinary process. It is more frequently accomplished, though, through Episcopal visitation. Again, the Charter states, we request that the bishop would offer counsel to us individually and as a diocese so that we would work toward a greater unity of practice. Such counsel shall be considered fraternal encouragement. What do presbyters and deacons owe their bishop? Since the Episcopal office's purpose is to maintain unity, presbyters and deacons owe the bishop insobedience, insofar as his counsels and oversight do not contradict the gospel. We ought to always seek peace amongst our parishes and ourselves, for as Ignatius says, there is nothing better than peace by which all warfare among those in heaven and those on earth is abolished. We strive for this peace and conquer by having the same mind as Christ. Ignatius writes in Magnesian 6 and in chapter 7, words that are instructed for all under Episcopal authority. Let all therefore accept the same attitude as God and respect one another. And let no one regard his neighbor merely in human terms, but in Jesus Christ love one another always. Let there be nothing among you that is capable of dividing you. But be united with the bishop and with those who lead as an example and lesson of incorruptibility. Therefore, as the Lord did nothing without the Father, either by himself or through the apostles, and he was united with him. So you must not do anything without the bishop and the presbyters. Do not convince, attempt to convince yourself that anything done apart from the others is right, but gather together. Let there be one prayer, one petition, one mind, one hope, with love and blameless joy, which is Jesus Christ than whom nothing is better. Finally, having the same mind, prayer, petition, hope, love, and blameless joy with Christ and the bishop, we refresh him by our prayers and otherwise as we have opportunity. For it is right for each, of, each one of you, Ignatius writes, and especially the presbyters, to encourage the bishop and to honor the Father and to the, and to the honor of Jesus Christ and of the apostles. May the obedience to the clergy, which Ignatius encourages, be found in our parishes. By God's grace, may it be found among us as well. We will close with Polycarp's words, or Ignatius' words to Polycarp in his sixth chapter. Pay attention to the bishop, in order that God may pay attention to you. I am a ransom on behalf of those who are obedient to the bishop, presbyters, and deacons, May it be granted to me to have a place among them in the presence of God. Train together with one another. Compete together. Run together. Suffer together. Rest together. Get up together as God's managers, assistants, and servants. Please the one whom you serve as soldiers, for whom you receive your, from whom you receive, you receive your wages. Let none of you be found a deserter. Let your baptism serve as a shield, faith as a helmet, love as a spear, endurance as armor. Let your deeds be your deposits, in order that you may eventually receive the savings that are due to you. Be patient, therefore, and gentle with one another, as God is with you. May I always have joy in you. I have a few moments for questions, comments. Accusations, protestations, <laughs> donations. <laughs> I just want to commend you for a fantastic paper. It's very instructive. Well, thank you, sir. I, I relied heavily upon your work from years past, so that 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 thanks goes both ways. <laughs> Turn it back over to our bishop. Yes, sir. I'd like to say about that, the same thing that I say about the book of Concord. That is the discussion. Thank you. 
Thank you, Pastor. Let's take a break for, oh, about 10 minutes, and then we'll resume.